So, hey, folks, uh, thanks for attending. Besides 10 year anniversary, shout out to the folks to get this uh, rebooted on our 10th. So they've done a tremendous amount of work getting us to where we're at today. So we're going to talk a little bit about so you want to be a CISO. And the real question is, is do you really want to be a CISO? Um, this is probably going to be a little interactive. We'll uh, try to save the questions to the end. If we run out of time, I'm going to lurk around in the Job Finder Discord channel. So if we run out and I can't get to your question, just ping me over there at the end. Really, uh, just so you know who I am, a lot of folks know me from the Boston area. Uh, I've been a CISO here in Boston for you know, 10, 15 years or so. Started my career as an engineer and then kind of migrated over to product management and then fell like most folks into the security practice um, by a happenstance, I guess. You know, I was doing some engineering work. They said, hey, do you want to be an AppSec person? I said, yeah, that sounds like something. And then I was an AppSec person and drifted over to become a CISO. And I've been a CISO here in the Boston area for quite a while. So this is kind of near and dear to me as I look to grow the next rounds of CISOs as I someday would like to retire. So someone's got to step up and take my job at some point. But really, the thing I wanted to start with is, is probably a story before we get into the talk today about why this talk. So I volunteer at the local vocational high school uh, to teach students in their computer technology program about various computer technology things. And at the end of one of the talks, you know, these COVID talks that we're doing as they're trying to bring people in so the kids can actually pay attention to the class, they, uh, a student reached out to me and said, so I wanna be a hacker and then I wanna be a CISO. And I said, okay, so let's put the hacker aside because that's probably a whole nother talk about whether you wanna be a hacker or not and what that means. And then I, I, I said to myself, okay, so you wanna be a CISO and it occurred to me that I had been giving this chat to both my staff and folks that I mentor probably hundreds of times over the course of my career, but recognizing that I have a scaling problem and that I can do that one-on-one -on -one with folks, but having a challenge of kind of broadly distributing that out. So that was what led to this particular talk. So this is my opportunity to kind of reach out and, and give this guidance that I have to as many folks as possible in, in one fell swoop, as opposed to me doing this as a one-off. So that was really what Genesis this talk, and really what we're gonna talk about today are four things. And this is kind of broad career advice as well. I know we're gonna focus a little bit on CISO, but the first couple of slides are really gonna be about you managing your own career. So the first one is probably the most important slide is why do you want to be a CISO. And again, broadly applicable to whatever career opportunity you want to do, but you got to understand why you want to do this before you can actually figure out how to do it. I think once you understand why, it's important for you to understand what a day in the life of a CISO is, because I'll be honest with you, it's probably not what you expect. Um, so, it, so you figure out why, you figure out what decision point now, do you really want this job? I will tell you, you know, what I see from folks is, is that by the time we have this conversation and folks that I mentor have this conversation, they generally say, I don't want this job. Let's assume for a second that we get past this and we now say, yep, still want the job. Got it. I'm motivated. I know what I want to do here. I understand what the job is. How do I get there? So we're going to spend some time talking about the skills and experience you're going to need to get this gig. And then lastly, I'll be honest with you, and I see it more and more so, now that you've had the job for a while, and I, I am a, a poster child for this, when's it time to leave? So I will talk a lot about this, and, and I'll shout out to the mental health hacker folks and the other channels. I think there is a time when you need to recognize that the job is not the job that you want to do anymore. So we're going to spend the, the last part of the presentation talking about that. As throughout this presentation, what I'll do is I'll, I'll try to give you a, a few nuggets of wisdom. I think I call them cautionary tales in the presentation. We're going to talk a little bit about that because there are areas that you need to focus in on. So when I talk about those cautionary tales, listen up a little bit, I guess, because those are the things that I found that are the most interesting parts that you should pay attention to because they're nuggets that you should take away and really think about. So when, I, when, that, when that happens, put down the diet, do I got one over here and, and kind of 
prick your ears up a little bit and pay attention to that because that's probably an important nugget for you guys to take away. Let's talk about motivation. So I'll, I'll be honest with you, you need to soul search for this job as well as any other job. Why do you actually want this gig? And for me, I, I look at four kind of big buckets for why people want to be a CISO. Left to right, I, I think these are the ones that I hear the most. So I hear the most on the left and all the way to the least on the right. But these are usually the big four buckets. The first one, I'll be honest with you, is money. Folks say CISOs make good cash. And the reality of that is that's very true. Um, if you look at the Boston area in itself and even the greater New England area, you know, your low salary for someone that carries the title of CISO is $250,000 all in with some variable compensation. And it can be as high as $400,000. So when you look at that number, it's a, it's a pretty interesting number. And right? if you're starting your career out at a junior analyst, risk analyst or a junior SOC analyst, you know, making fifty or sixty thousand dollars, that that's a tremendous amount of money. What I will tell you is, is that do not fall into the trap that it's solely based on money. Uh, you know, I think if I look back on my career and when I started, a lot of my early decisions were money based, but as I progressed up, it became much more what I'll call mission based in that it was less about that extra dollar in my paycheck and more about believing in the opportunity that I was pursuing. My cautionary tale with respect to money is beware of the golden handcuffs. You know, I know folks, we were, there was a back and forth on the Discord channel earlier today. We were talking about salary in the Boston area. There are organizations that will golden handcuff you. If you're not familiar with that phrase, it means they will pay you more than the market rate. I would caution you to not adjust your lifestyle to that golden handcuff because at some point in time, the handcuffs will come off and you will be in a situation where you're living above your means. So I guess my, my guidance and cautionary tale to you all is just money is a great motivator, but what I will tell you is for me personally, believe in the mission more than anything else because I think you'll probably have a lot more job satisfaction than the cash. The cash is transient and perishable. I think mission is probably more important. The second motivator that I see for folks is prestige. I'm a C, right? All of a sudden I'm a chief. And with that, you know, folks believe that there's a certain amount of prestige being called the chief information security officer, the chief security officer, the chief trust officer, or whichever variant you may have in your organization. What I will tell you is, is that, yes, there's a, there is a little bit of cachet, and we jokingly call it the key to the executive washroom. You know, once you're a CISO, you're always a CISO. But the reality of it is, is that the job in itself, and it, except in very few organizations, you are not on par with the rest of your C-level compatriots. And we, we like to call this the little C. So no matter how much you feel that you are going to be a C-level participant in the organization, the reality of it is, is that you're always probably going to be a little C comparatively to your internal peers. So you are likely not on par with the chief financial officer or the chief legal officer and general counsel. So while there is prestige in the C, what I would tell you is, is that recognize that you will likely always be the little C in your organization. Now, there are obviously caveats in every one of these and certain organizations take you know, have an executive level C, CISO or CSO that reports to the CEO, but those are few and far between. And I've seen many organizations that have tried that and then backpedaled and dropped that person down under the CIO or under the COO or something else. So, so just recognize that, yes, there is prestige for it, but you may not be the level of prestige that you think you have. The next one, power, right? So you are the head of security. You are in charge. You can do everything. You tell folks what to do. Yes, to a fashion. But what I would tell you is that that command and control mindset is very 1990s. You know, modern CISOs of today, it's about influence. It's not about command and control. And if you feel that you're going to come in 
and roll over folks and get what you want because you're the CISO, you're in the wrong gig. I'll be honest with you. That gig just doesn't work in 2020. So if you're in it for power, you're not in it. I'm going to be brutally honest with you. Um, this is not the role for you because you're not going to have the power that you think you have based on the title that you think you have. So the last one is probably the most interesting one. I, I think a lot of folks think that they have to. So they look at the pyramid of progression inside information security and they say, hey, in order for me to move up, I've got to be the CISO. Right, that's the pinnacle role for information security. I'll tell you that that's not true. You know, I think you've been sold a bill of goods that you have to be the CISO. The reality of it is, is that there are great careers to be had and not being the person that has to take the CISO role. If and, and I'll just do a little shout out for folks, I you know, shameless promotion. I posted out some career ladders out on GitHub, the open source. In there, it'll demonstrate that you can make a really good salary and never have to be the CISO. But I think people fall into this trap that they they think they have to be that person because it's the top role. And I will tell you that is absolutely not true. You can have a great career and not be the CISO in information, information security. There are other motivators, obviously, with respect to this, but these are the four that I hear and all the folks that I talk to. So, you know, you need to do a little soul search and figure out what's motivating you for this. Is it the money? Is it the prestige? Is it the power? Is it because I have to? Because before we talk about what the job is, you really need to understand why you're on this journey. So if you look at these things and you go, all right, Mark, I, I think I have to or I, I, I want the money. I think we should segue over to what the job is because these two things together will decide whether this is the right job for you. So we're gonna move over to, so so what does a day look like for a CISO? And I'll be honest with you, it's probably not what you would expect it to be. And again, results will vary. Smaller organizations, the mix will be different. Larger organizations are gonna be much more like this, but I'll be honest with you, this is what I generally see in, organ in what I would call a typical information security organization of you know 10-ish people. Five to five to fifteen is usually what if you if you've seen some research where the average information security department size is. This is what your day is going to look like. So I'm going to be honest with you. If this doesn't appeal to you, this is not the job for you. Let's talk about. We'll, we'll, let's start on the left. Subject matter expertise. I will tell you that if you think you're going to be a technologist as a CISO, you're in the wrong gig. Um, you are not there to be a player coach. You are there to coach the team. And if you're spending your time running plays on the field, be it soccer, football, rugby, whatever it is, you are not doing a service to your team. You're not a CISO. You're just a technologist with a title. I'll be honest with you. Um, you're not doing the task that you need to do at an executive level to be successful in the organization. So if, if this is creeping north now, I'm going to be honest with you, there are times when that has to happen. There's an expectation you're a technologist because you're the chief information security officer. So you still need to understand technology, but your days of running scanners and responding to JIRA tickets is effectively done. You should not be doing that. And if it's creeping north of your time for any reasonable amount of time, then you're not really doing the role that you should be doing in the organization. Moving down, paperwork. So welcome to being a leader and a manager in an organization. So roughly 20% of your time is going to be spent doing paperwork. Everything from signing your regulatory reports, be it for HIPAA or PCI or ISO attestation, to doing your employee reviews and evals, one of the most important tasks that you could be doing. Uh, working with procurement to buy all those fancy tools that you need to have in your organization or working on suppliers because customers want you to talk to them about what they're buying from you. Or famously developing your executive reports, whether it's up to your CIO or your quarterly board reports. 
you're going to spend a tremendous amount of time doing paperwork. So if you do not like doing PowerPoint, uh, probably not a good spot for you because you're going to do a fair amount of PowerPoint in your lifespan. The, the cautionary tale I would tell you here is do not let this get away from you because you could easily fall into the trap where the bulk of your time is spent doing paperwork. What I would tell you here is if it starts to get more than a third of your time, you need to delegate. You're a leader in an organization. You have staff that sits underneath you. Make them do the paperwork. They need to learn how to do this as they progress their career. So make sure that you can delegate out because you have more important things over on the right, which we'll get to in a second. Otherwise, get yourself an admin. You know, when I first started, I didn't think that I could ever use an admin, but once I got my first administrative assistant, it was the best thing that ever happened. You know, they they kept me on track. They made sure that the things that I would slip off my day to day were taken care of. Um, granted, larger organizations. So as a CISO, you're you're likely not going to get an admin until you get to a certain size. But my cautionary tale is: do not get overwhelmed with paperwork. Either delegate it out, or or get yourself an admin to do it. Enable your team. I want to call out number two here. Again, I, I know I talked a little bit about it, but one of the most, it's, my opinion is, one of the most important things that you can do as a leader of an information security organization is to ensure that you're growing your staff. So just like we're having this conversation about how you're going to grow your career, while it's important for you to manage your own career, it's also important for you as a leader to make sure that your team is progressing. So for me personally, one of the most important things that I take away to my team is to make sure that I'm growing their career and making sure that they're doing the things they need to grow their career as well. I think it's the most important thing you guys can do for folks out there. Moving to the right, and everybody's gonna probably have a big sigh with this. I will tell you, that 75% of your time is going to be spent in meetings. And I pause there because that is really what you're going to expect as a CISO in an organization. You're not player coaching anymore. So you're not turning bytes and running scanners and doing code reviews. You're filling out paperwork. The reality of it is, is it's probably the most important thing that you can do for your team for a number of reasons. And we'll go through them here in a second but you're going to spend 75% of your time day to day in meetings. So what does that mean? Out of an eight hour day, six hours of your day, north of six hours of your day is going to be meeting somebody in the organization or outside the organization. The reason I think it's the most important thing you can do is because your job as a CISO is to influence the organization and your stake, external stakeholders. You need to market your team, meaning your team has a, a portfolio of things that you're doing for the organization. You need to let the organization know that you're there and you're doing, you hung a shingle, a security shingle in the org. You better let people know what you're doing and how they're gonna do it. That's your internal marketing. You need to do your external marketing, right? You have a great team. You're gonna need to recruit people at some point in time. You do that through external marketing. My team is good. It's great working here you're doing talks, you're doing all of those things that are necessary to, to make sure that there's an awareness of your program in the organization. Because without awareness, your team's gonna be very ineffective. So if people don't know you're there and what you do, they're not gonna come to you for advice, guidance, or whatever. So marketing, up and down communications. So I, I say this specifically up and down. So you as a leader need to communicate downwards to your organizations what's going on you need to talk to your staff so you should be having meetings with your people if the last time you've talked to somebody is six months ago you have a problem you need to make sure that they're you're providing constant feedback back to your team likewise you need to communicate up meaning that a lot of your time is spent talking to your peers or your seniors to let them know the great job you're doing in information security and also the things that you need from them to be successful in reducing risk for the organization. If we look at a spread, you know, if we look at the layers of management in a, in a typical organization, a level one manager, you know, a typical manager spends most of their time communicating to their staff. 
a level two manager, which say is a director, spends a bulk of their time communicating across the organization and down to their subordinates. A level three manager, meaning a vice president and above, spends a tremendous amount of their time communicating up and out. So as you progress in an organization, that communication is gonna be critical for you to be successful. Third item, goal alignment. You need to get out there and make sure that everybody knows what your charter is, what you hope to accomplish, and make sure it aligns with the business requirements that are out there. Your number one job is to make sure that your goals align with everybody else's goals. Because if you have goals that don't align with the business goals, your goals aren't getting done. So you need to make sure that you're out there telling folks what's important, why it's important, and how your what you're doing aligns to what's important for them. Fourth, strategy. You need a plan and you need to communicate that plan out to the organization. So you need to figure out where you're going, pick your North Star, figure out how the team's going to get there and communicate that strategy up both to your peer groups and all the way up to the board of directors if, you're, if you need to. Lastly, business impact. So what you're doing and how it impacts the business is one of the most important things that you can articulate out to the organization. If you cannot tie what you're doing to true business impact for the org, you eventually will have a smaller budget and fewer people. I'll tell you that straight up. So you need to make sure that whatever strategy and goals that you set up and you've aligned can tie to a direct business impact because eventually your budget will get smaller if it doesn't. All of these things together position your team and you to be successful in the organization. So all of this time that you're meeting folks and having conversations is probably the most important thing that you can do in the organization because at the end of the day, your job is to enable your team to be successful. So if you're not having these meetings and having these conversations and aligning, your team ultimately is not gonna be successful in the organization. So with that, the cautionary tale here is if you're not doing this, you are doing a disservice to your team. So if you're holed up in your office, not having communications about what your plan is and how it's impactful for the business, you are not gonna have a successful team in that organization. It may not happen right away. It may happen in 18 months, but someday someone's gonna cross the T and dot an I and your team is gonna be much smaller and be less impactful in the organization. So we've talked about why you want the job. Now we've talked about what you're gonna do during the day. And I suspect that there are a lot of folks on the call and on this on this are going, I'm not sure I want this job. And the reality of it is, I'll share you a nugget. So of the 200 or so folks that I've spoken to about this, we get to this stage in the conversation and I would say a full 85% of them go, this is not the job that I want. I've recognized that I thought I had to, I am not a fan of paperwork and meetings all day. I want to be a technologist and that's not my job. I think I want to stay in the technical track and be an architect or I want to be in consulting or something else. So if you're sitting there listening to this saying, I'm not sure, I'm going to tell you, you're probably in with the bulk of the people who have said, this is probably not the job that I'm interested in. Um, I, I don't really want this gig. So you can stop now and listen. Stop now and, and drop if you've said this is not what I want, but we're going to move on to. All right. So you've, you've, you've got the right motivation. You've got you understand what the job is. and You're like, I'm in, Mark. Right. I'm ready to go for this job. So how do I get there? Right. We, we've got to a point now where I've committed. I think it's the job that I want to apply for. So let's, let's talk about you know what it's going to take to get there. So how do I prep for this? A lot of words here and we'll do our best to get through these, but there are kind of eight core functional areas that you need to begin to start prepping yourself to take on this responsibility. So you know what you need to do, you know what the job is, but let's just talk through these. So technical skills, I mentioned it earlier. There's an expectation that you have technical acumen. I, I, it's changed a little bit recently. You know, there are a lot more CISOs that are coming on that are business focused, but at the end of the day, there's still an expectation that the chief information security officer is a technologist. So while you don't really necessarily know, you need to know how to run the blinky boxes, you better know what the blinky boxes do and have a sense of what there are. And if for nothing else, you can cry foul on the team if they're trying to pull something over your eyes and say, hey, Mark, I need the widget over here. And you're like, oh yeah, the widget, we should buy one of those widgets. 
So you still need to have some technical acumen. So do not let that slide. But again, I, what I would tell you is you don't necessarily need to be the end all be all of all technology. Now, the difference here is that as you grow your career, you're a technologist, 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 CISO. So you're growing your technical acumen throughout the, the early stages of your career. You just need to keep that at a level playing field and keep up with it as you get there. So keep growing as you're growing up through the positions, but recognize that it's not gonna be an absolute that you know everything from a technology perspective when you get to the CISO job. Secondly, time and grade. I get it, it's not fair. You know, the whole time and grade, you need to spend 10 years in a job before you get promoted is very 1950-ish, 1960-ish. But the expectation of any C-level position is, is that you've got some time uh, in the job or, or in industry. So you, you, let's be honest, you're not gonna get a CISO gig if you got less than seven plus years. You may get one uh, in title with less than that. The reality is it's probably more likely a player coach job and you're not doing a true CISOs gig. Um, so for better or worse, fair or not, there's gonna be an expectation that you, you're likely not gonna hit this gig until you get at least seven to 10 years under your belt in industry before they give, they give you the position. Next one, controversial, education. What I would tell you is that historically and historically within the last 10 years or so, you know, human resources for any professional position is, is generally required a bachelor's degree in any discipline, right? Basket weaving, music, not to downplay those, but it could be in anything. They just want a bachelor's degree. The reality of it is, is that I am of the opinion that in order to be a great information security person, a bachelor's degree is not an absolute requirement. And I've hired to that in the past. I think attitude and aptitude are the two most important things that I look for in an information security professional. The bachelor's degree just proves to me that you can get through four years at a college and pass some tests. Um, so, so for me, I don't require that for any one of my jobs that I generally hire uh, in information security. Likewise, like I said earlier, I don't care what it's in. So if you do come with a bachelor's degree, do not feel that, you know, sorry, Boston College, Northeastern, everybody else. It doesn't have to be in cybersecurity. I'll, I will tell you that some of the best information security professionals I've ever hired have had non-technology degrees. Uh, one of the best people that I've mentored up and now he's become a CISO, he's got a degree in classical jazz and he's spectacular with respect to his ability to be an information security professional. So if you're a non-traditional tech person, do not feel that a, a career in information security is outside the realm. It's at, and not an absolute. Again, much to the chagrin of uh, my folks in higher education, I will tell you, as far as an advanced degree is concerned, only pursue one if it's a skill you're going to need. So do not go off and say, I think I need an MBA for this job because you don't. You really don't need an MBA. If you think you need an MBA because you need to learn about finance and accounting and marketing, go get the MBA. But the reality of it is, is requiring an MBA or a PhD in cyber is really a waste of your time. Um, like I said, only get that advanced degree if you feel you need to get it to learn new skills. Otherwise, you're just spending money and time that could be better spent with your family or doing a hobby that you're interested in. So let's talk about certifications. Um, so when you start out your information security career and you're junior, like, yeah, everybody, let's get a CISSP. Um, and, you know, there's some mildly interesting things about getting through the HR gauntlet with a certification, right? So sometimes you get one. I have a couple, most information security people have at least one just because someone said they needed to get one in the past. What I would tell you for the CISO role is uh, there are certified CISOs. I, I couldn't tell you what a certified CISO is be honest with you. So if you're looking at that and you're going to learn something from the process, go ahead and take the cert. But it's not something that I look at, nor have I heard any of the executive recruiters look at and say, well, this guy's got a certified CISO and this person has a certified CISO and I'm going to hire the certified one over the other certified one. I've never seen that happen. And I haven't heard that from uh, any of the executive recruiters that I've dealt with. So while it's mildly important when you start out and get yourself a cert, as you progress up, 
becomes less and less important. Sorry, ISAC and ISE squared. Moving over to the right, business skills. I'm gonna tell you, this is the most, probably the most important skill that you can get as you progress up to a CISO. So you, you're a technologist, you've started your career as a technologist, you've learned all of this stuff. Uh, like I can configure a firewall and I can do guard duty on AWS. You better know about finance, sales, and marketing and operations because your job is a business leader in the organization. So you need to have skills in all of these. They don't have to be like a practitioner level skills, but you better understand budgets. You better understand the sales process because in many cases, especially if you're working at a product company, you're gonna be asked to participate in the sales process. So you better understand what that process is and what you can say and what you can't say and what pipeline is. You better understand marketing. Um, and you know, for me, I wasn't a marketing person. I went to work for a security vendor uh, right into the deep end of the pool, right? And all of a sudden I'm a marketing person. I have a persona and I've got to like speak and do all these other things. You better understand what pipeline is and what leads are because those are going to be important for you. Lastly, um, and this is a bit controversial when I tell folks this that have started their whole career in information security, what I would suggest to you is leave for a short period of time, a year or 18 months if you have the opportunity. Take an assignment in the business. And, and here's the rationale for that. What I find, especially when you're at a larger company and you're dealing with a board of directors, there's an expectation of your business credibility. So if you've always been a technologist, you wanna be seen as a business person because that's what's gonna drive change in the organization at that level. And if you've never actually been a business person, you lack that credibility at the senior level. So what I, what I try to recommend to folks that are, are progressing at a, you know, say a Fortune 2000 company or above, you should consider like taking another assignment somewhere else for a while. For me, I had the privilege of actually running product management for a little while carrying a number which is an interesting bit um, if you've never done that before being, being on the other side of the house so I was running the AppSec team saying hey you need to go do all of this stuff and all of a sudden I'm on the other side listening to my former AppSec folks tell me oh by the way I need you to do this and you're like well hey I've got a ship tomorrow and so it gives you a perspective that you may not have so if you have an opportunity to do this I would highly encourage you guys to take advantage of this when you can. Next thing that's probably the second most important thing is you need friends. And we're gonna talk about, these next three are about friends. So your first set of friends is your cross-discipline friends. So you need to find friends and other things that are not information security because they're going to help you with things at some point in time. So you need, to un you need friends in finance, you need friends in legal, you need friends in marketing because you need to, you're gonna need to draw on these friends at certain points in your career to help you get through certain issues. Your next set of friends is your bench. So as you're progressing up, you're meeting a whole bunch of colleagues. Start ferreting out those colleagues because eventually when you get the CISO's job, you're going to have to build a team and who better to staff the team with, with all those friends that you have that you know are great SOC people or they're great risk people or they're great AppSec people. So you need to start to begin to build your bench of people that when you take the CISO job, you can call upon them to restaff your team because that's the reality. Most jobs, you guys probably have seen this, come through networking, not through getting something on Indeed, let's be honest. So you're gonna get your, your gig on Indeed, through your network, not through just submitting out there. And that's especially true with CISOs. So you need to make sure that when you roll in, and if that new team has a problem in AppSec, as an example, you've got a leader on the bench that you can bring in and say, I'm gonna bring Sally in and she's gonna run this AppSec program. And I know her, I know what she can do, and we're ready to go. Lastly, I call it external squirrels. So as you're progressing up, your peers are progressing up as well. Right, so you're coming up with a group. I have a group here in Boston that are my peers that we, we communicate all the time in Signal on our Secret Squirrel channel. You need these people as much as you need the other two. You need confidants. You need people that you can talk to about various security issues. So you need to cultivate your external squirrel network. 
because those folks are going to be there for you when you say, I have a, I need this in information security. You need people to ask. You know, you can go ask Deloitte, you can ask Gartner, but your your best source of information or is going to be your external squirrel network. So you need to cultivate all three of these as you're progressing up through your career. So tech skills, time and grade, education, certification, foundational. CISO level skills, business skills, networking, three full networking. Get yourself a bench, get yourself some friends that are InfoSec, and get yourself some InfoSec friends. You need to do all eight of these things as you prepare to take this job. So you're there. Mark, I, I, I've done all of these things, right? I, I, I got the tech skills, I, 10 years, got the education, my cert, eh, I've learned about finance, I got this group. Okay, so now we're going to go and try to get the job, right? So this is your first time trying to get the CISO gig. So how do we land it, right? So you're trying to land the whale. So how, so how does this happen? Um, I said earlier, and it's kind of funny that, you know, once a CISO, always a CISO, and it holds true. It's much easier to get your second CISO job than it is to get your first CISO job. Because once you get the title, someone's taken the opportunity to give you the title, it's a little bit easier to get that. Um, so this is really about how to land the first one. The second one is much easier because you've already got it and you've got some background on this. So where to look, right? So how do I start trying to find this gig? Use your squirrels and your bench. So in the community here in Boston for CISOs, we all talk, we all about, we know all about all the open CISO recs as people move around. So your squirrel network will tell you generally where there's openings. Likewise, your bench, right? So all of a sudden, you know, you've cultivated a bench and this person's working over at this organization and they're gonna open a CISO role and you've worked with them before, they really like you, they're gonna get you that information even before the job goes to the recruiter. So, you know, make sure that you keep in contact with these folks. They will be your best source of ground intelligence about when CISO roles are coming up at night. Secondly, look for internal transfer opportunities. This is really focused on big organizations. So in larger organizations, they have this concept of a B CISO, or business operating unit CISO. And really what this is, is kind of a mini CISO in a functional group uh, within an organization. So I'll tell you folks, and you can look at my LinkedIn, I, I worked at EMC and they had this construct where uh, we had a CISO, CSO for the overall EMC organization, and there were business unit CISO. So it's your opportunity to become a micro CISO in an org as a step up to being the final CISO. So if you have an opportunity in a large organization to take this business focused one, because you're you're effectively the CISO of that mini operating unit. So you have all the benefits of being a CISO and all the benefits of calling back to the larger organization for areas that where you need support. So I would strongly urge if you have that opportunity, take that opportunity because it shows that you know you go from running a team, running the risk team to being a B CISO, say for this particular business unit, all of a sudden you have, you, you know, you're a CISO of a $700 million uh, business unit in a large organization, that transition to go be the full CISO at a billion dollar company is an easy step up because you have a good story. Even though you weren't the macro CISO, you, you, you were in charge of $700 million of this $64 billion company. Lastly, what I would say is consider a down to up opportunity. And what does that mean? So, so what that means is, a lot of times you're working in a large information security organization, you're a director, and maybe you got 30 people working for you. Um, like I said earlier, sometimes getting the title lends itself for the job after that. So some advice that I was giving on the, the, uh, the job recruiter chat a little earlier in Discord was, always take a job for the job after this job. So down to up exactly means that. So I'm going to take a job in a smaller team with a CISO recognizing that I'm going to be there for two years so that the job that I take after that is now a CISO at a hundred person organization. So don't be afraid sometimes to step down in team size, recognizing you're going to step up in responsibility in the job after you do the step down. So it, it requires a little bit of planning and think through, but you, you need to be thinking about two steps out, not just the next step. Cautionary tale with respect to this. You know, once you're out there, the recruit, be careful of recruiters. I love recruiters. I've used recruiters in the past, but they don't always have your best interests in mind, right? They're there to fill the job. 
So just recognize who you're dealing with and their motivations. It's just like hiring a financial planner. You know, you get one that's independent and you get one that's going to sell you, sell you their own stuff because they get commission. Just recognize that when you're dealing with that, especially executive recruiters, they stand to make a tremendous amount of money. When you get your second CISO gig, you now get reached out by these executive recruiters. They're going to probably, you know, they're, they're looking at getting your whole salary paid to them when they fill the role. So just recognize the motivation. Um, when when you're dealing with the recruiters so you got to lead things to watch out for so, so you got to lead on this job things to watch out for um scope of the role is important what does this mean it means that you need to try to figure out what your remit is you know a lot of times they'll say you're the CISO but you're not right you're, you're a CISO in title um and I'll give you a a story. So I worked at Dun & Bradstreet. I ran enterprise operations many, many years ago. And at the time, Dun & Bradstreet hired their first information security professional. And I'll use his name because I, I, I know him. His name is Jack Radigan. And Jack's remit and his scope was to run information security. Um, he didn't have any budget or any staff. His job was to talk about information security and if something happened and there was a breach, he'd get fired. So what I would tell you is um, you need to recognize that and try to tease that out because you do not want to be Jack Radigan. And if you are going to be Jack Radigan, make sure you're compensated well for being Jack Radigan and you know you're Jack Radigan before you get into that. So sorry, Jack, if you're listening. Um, and I know I use your example all the time, but just recognize that that's the scope that you have. Also, it's, it's important on the business side as well. So is it business focused? Is it just your online presence? Is it the whole organization? Also, what other things are you're going to be responsible for? Is it InfoSec? Is it include physical security? Do you have privacy on top of that? All of those things are going to be important to, to understand when, you, when you're going through the job. Secondly, Title is not as important as job responsibility. So even though you might come in as a senior director and not the CISO, if you're effectively being the CISO, don't get hung up on the title because you're doing the job. And when you go to get the job after that, you can articulate why you are effectively the CISO. Because I've seen many CISOs that aren't doing the job of CISOs and when they go to get the next one, they fail in the interview. So don't get too hung up on it. It's nice to have, like I said, executive washroom key, but don't get hung up on it as long as you're doing the gig. Lastly, understand the budget you have and the budget you don't have. So as you're going through the process, it's important to know the budget you have and what you don't have. Because what you don't want to do back to scope is get into a position where you get hired in as the CISO, maybe the first CISO they have, and there's no budget and no staff. Because all of a sudden, you're not going to be effective at implementing any strategy without that. And I'll be honest with you, just be leery of organizations say, well, we'll figure the budget out when you get here because we're not sure you're going to set that all up. There's something to be said for that, but also just be cautious. That only really happens on brand new teams. If there's an existing team that's out there that are doing security, get figure out what your budget is and what you have before you actually figure out whether this is the role for you. Because you could have grand plans for a strategy and then recognize that you have no money or staff to actually implement that strategy. Cautionary tale here. Um, don't pursue the executive washroom key at the expense of your ability to deliver to your team or family. There's a mouthful there, but don't take the title if you're never going to be home. I mean, I, I, you know, your motivation may be money. It might be anything like that. But what I'm telling you is my perception is it's not worth it. And we're going to talk about burnout in the next slide a little bit. But don't sacrifice for the key. I guess. Let's talk about the interview. So you're there, right? You, you got a lead. You looked it up. You got whatever ground intelligence you could get from your from your bench or your squirrels. Uh, you got a good sense. Something I want to go for. So you're, you're going in for the interview. Um, you're going to talk to business people, not technical people. So you better know how to speak business. Back to the earlier slide about business skills. You know, if you're talking about firewalls and WAFs and that stuff wrong interview and it's going to go over their head and they go this guy's a technologist he doesn't know my problems uh i don't think he's a good fit for the organization 
the whole conversation should be business speak. They are not going to test your technical acumen like a, 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 a another security professional. They're not there to do that. Secondly, demonstrate your collaborative skills. Security is a partnership, as you guys are well aware. So you know you need to be able to demonstrate through examples your collaboration skills because you're, these are folks that you're going to need to work with throughout your career at this organization. They're going to want to make sure you're a good partner. If you can't demonstrate you're a good partner, they're not going to want to partner with you, and they're, therefore, they're not going to hire you. Lastly, be sincere, meaning that be honest. Right? They um, they want to make sure you're a human being. You know, don't try to answer the don't try to answer the question you think they want to hear. Don't do that. Just answer it like you're going to answer it. If it's not a right fit for you, it's not a right fit for you. Don't try to fake your way into the job. Just be yourself. If that's what they want to hire, they'll hire you. If not, they won't. No harm, no foul. Lastly, this is critical for folks. This role is based on integrity. I don't think I need to tell folks, but I've seen this happen. Do not lie during this interview process. This community is too small, and I'll be honest with you, they will find out. Whether they find out after they hire you or they find out through the process, you will get a reputation and it will follow you around. So we are security professionals. It's about integrity. Like that's the I and the CIA triad. Do not lie during the interview process. There's exaggeration and there's lying, right? So, but I'm telling you, if you lie, you will be found out. Don't do it. You will ruin your career eventually for this. So where to look? Went to the interview, got the job. Awesome, right? First CISO gig. What I would tell you is you need to last through probation, right? So you're generally going to be on probation for 90 days. I will tell you that I have seen folks flash out and only last 30 or 60 days in new CISO gigs. So your first goal should be you need to last through your probation. And how do you do that? First thing, meet as many people as possible during that time. You know, your job, go back to the two slides ago, meetings, meetings, meetings. You need to figure out who your friends are. You need to figure out what they do. You need to have as many meetings as possible because that's what's going to get you the ground intelligence and the visibility you're going to need to build a successful program. Second thing, this is especially true if you already have a team. Your first duty of care is to the team that's there, right? They might possibly have lost a new leader or there's a new organizational structure. One of the most important things that you can do right out of the gate is take care of your team. They might be, there might be shock because of a leader's left or a shock because of a reorganization. One of the most important, these are the people that you're gonna build success in the organization off of, take care of them first. It will pay forward tenfold. Lastly, as you're preparing for this, you should have a sketch of a 30, 60, 90 day plan, meaning that you should come in with a rough idea of what you wanna do. Now, that goes to the cautionary tale of this is be humble. You don't know everything. Every organization is different. Do not lead in in your first 90 days saying you know how to solve everything in the world because you've done it six times over in different places. You've never done it at this company. You need to be humble about the people that preceded you in the organization that's there. So while I tell you you need to have a plan, that plan needs to be adapted for the organization it is. If you come in saying you know everything, you will probably not last through probation. So congratulations. You have the motivation, you've liked the job, you've got the job, and you've lasted through probation. So now you're on your way, right? Your career's on the way. Um, and you're doing the CISO gig, doing the CISO gig, and then you're like, maybe I don't want to do the CISO gig anymore. So let's let's talk about life after CISO. So when is it time to go? Let's be honest, and this is broadly applicable to any role that you may have. When is it time to go? Sometimes it's involuntary. I hate to tell you this, but as a CISO, sometimes you're just gonna get fired. You've done everything that you can do. You did it the best of your ability. And the reality of it is, is that some there's been a breach or something happened and someone has to be accountable and you're it. 
Hence the reason all the way back to the first slide, the money is really good to be a CISO because the, the reality of it is, is that you can be fired at any one particular point in time. It's not personal. Now, sometimes it is, sometimes you screwed up and you really deserve to get fired, but sometimes it's, it's, it's not that way. It's not personal. They just have to do it. You need to recognize that and move on. What I will tell you is that the second part of this is, it's funny enough, it, it, there's no stigma to getting fired. Un, unlike other roles, there's sometimes an expectation a system may get fired just because. So unless you're getting fired every job over a course of time, there's not as much stigma to it as you would expect. Secondly is burnout. So a lot of times, if you think you're going to work 40 hours a week, not happening. Uh, back to mental health hackers. You are going to work 24-7. Um, breaches, regulatory reports. This is not a job if you think you're going to be, this is not a lifestyle job. Uh, you are going to be busy. And a lot of times I've seen many of my peers burn out. They look to alcohol, they turn on their families, they're not sleeping, they're not getting the help. I'll be honest with you, the job's not worth it. Um, you need to move on if you find yourself in this situation. Third, mission. You know, this is for me, it, it holds true. I want to believe in what the company is doing. If I don't believe in what the company is doing, I find it really hard to get motivated to do work. So a lot of times you'll take a job because the mission was with something you believed in and either the company's changed direction or they're not fulfilling the mission. If you can't look yourself in the mirror and say, I enjoy working here and I believe in what we're doing, get another gig. Lastly is growth. So a lot of times um, you've done everything you can do. You've been at the organization, you've grown the team, it's an awesome team. You're not getting what you need and you're also holding back the subordinates underneath you to grow. So sometimes it's time for you just to move to the next opportunity um, and let one of your subordinates take over, get somebody from the outside. You've done everything you've done, you did a great job, you built a great team, sometimes it's just time to move on. But the, real, the reality of it is, is you know, InfoSec is, is an always moving profession you know, most people don't retire in grade in InfoSec. So if you're going to move on, where do you go? Uh, CISO round two, I call it. So you've moved on to another organization. You move up. You're making more money. You're climbing the ladder, as I call it. A friend of mine did this. He's the CISO over at Home Depot, and he's been progressively moving up the ladder in the size of the organization he has. And now he's got a team of like 800 people as a CISO of, of, um, of Home Depot. Recognize what you're signing up for for that. You're probably moving around, a lot more headache, um, a lot more money, but there is there is this progression up larger organizations. Second, the noble approach, consulting or teaching. So take what you've learned, teach other people about it, right? So go be an adjunct at Boston College or Northeastern or do some consulting work. And this is the path that I took. You know, I, I was done being a CISO and I've gone off and, and started a consultancy and that's what I chose to do with the rest of my career. Build something. Right? You, there's a lot of security startups. There's plenty of money here in the Boston area for security startups. You got a great idea. Be a business person. You got all those business skills now. You learned them all. Go build something. Build the next great security product out there. Be an entrepreneur. Lastly, you know, if you've taken my advice earlier, is take a business role. So Maybe you become a CIO. Maybe you're the COO. You, you've learned all of that stuff. Why not choose to do that? But I guess the moral of the story here is just, just recognize, folks, that there will be a point in your career where the role that we've just worked through, you, you, you've aligned on, you've taken it, and you really want to do it, it's time for you to move. And it could be for the reasons on the left, and you're going to the reasons on the right. But I would tell you that at least my experience has been most CISOs only do a few turns in the game. And if I look back at all the friends that I know uh, and the friends that have moved on, you know, except for the real high growthers that are kind of moving up through the ladder, most folks do two to five turns tops as a CISO, and they're generally moving on to something else. So just recognize that there is life after CISO. So you've worked really hard to get this job. Just recognize that this may not be the job that you retire on. So with that, a couple of things. Um, this is my contact information. We'll take questions here in a second. Uh, and like I said, I'll be on the job finder piece afterwards. A couple of shout outs. 
so one I'd mentioned earlier, um, as part of my last 10 years or so, I've collated a bunch of career information. Um, so I've GitHubbed it out, it's all open source. So if folks want it, you can just chat me and I'll give it to you. It has career ladders, skills you need, both business and technical, along with salaries out there for uh, basically the greater New England area. So feel free to consume, happy to answer questions.